Today on the Investing for Freedom podcast, I've got a good friend of mine, Michael Manthe, in the studio with me. Um, we actually recorded this episode a couple months ago uh, when Michael was in town and had a lot of fun doing it. One of the things that I have always appreciated about Michael is just how genuine he is. Um, as you'll see in this episode, he doesn't hold back anything um, in regards to his faith and his beliefs. And I just love the way that him and his family tie all that into business and just the way that they make decisions along the way. So um, I love Michael's conviction. It's going to be an interesting story. You're going to hear about how Michael um, was actually in the ministry and how he felt led out of that, which was a pretty amazing story, and how him and his wife got into real estate investing. One of my favorite parts of this whole episode is when he tells the story about um, you know uh, him and his wife going to his in-laws and just kind of their take on um, this piece of property and how they invested. But anyway, I will just let you get into the show. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. And make sure you listen to the end and um, just hear how you can reach out to Michael and just see what they've got going on over at the Elevate Investing Group. Um, pretty, pretty interesting organization that's just flourished overnight. So uh, without further ado, here's Michael Manthe. Are you looking for freedom? Freedom from the daily grind and hustle? Or just finding a way to live the life you always wanted? Then join us on the Investing for Freedom podcast. Our host, Mike Ayala, will help you discover new ways to find freedom with tips, insights, and interviews. You'll learn the exact systems he's used to travel the world and live his best life. True success and happiness are all about freedom. And here's your roadmap on how to find freedom on your own terms. Welcome to the Investing for Freedom podcast. Here's your host, Mike Ayala. I am so excited to have Michael Manthe in house today. Um, Michael is with us from... Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Thanks now, for having me. It's great to have you, Michael. Um, tell us why you're in town. We are in town to uh, celebrate a mentor and friend's uh, wife who um, passed in December. So Russell Gray with the Real Estate Guys had a beautiful service yesterday. Him and his children put on to honor, celebrate, and memorialize Sherry Gray's life. It was powerful. It was powerful. Um, I really walked away from that. Um, just, just realizing, you know, what a blessing it is to, um, be alive and just have those days. But also Sherry was just such a, um, she was just such a good human. And it mm -hmm. makes me realize that every day we get to wake up, um, you know, we just need to serve more. We need to give more. We need to be more. So totally. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Her life was beautiful. I mean, that's what it did for me. I talked to a number of people there and they were all inspired to be better humans. Yeah. It's incredible. It was amazing. Um, so we'll get into this more, um, obviously throughout the interview, but just give us the, the two minute overview of Michael. Wow. You didn't prep me for that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have a beautiful wife back home, uh, two beautiful little girls, Serena and Gabriella. They are the lights of our life. And we, yeah, we've been having a lot of fun in the real estate investing world. Um, thanks to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all those years ago, really kind of opened our eyes to all that real estate investing can do for our family, can do for our future. And it's grown from there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. I'm getting to know you a little better over this trip has been awesome. But, you know, over the last couple of years, just being part of the real estate guys and, and just getting to know you and your family and the extended family. Um, I'm just really excited to get into the story in the background because um, I, I just watching you guys from a distance and seeing everything you're doing has been pretty awesome. So I'm pretty excited about it. Before we dive into all that, here's the four questions. Okay. Who has had the greatest impact on your life? Wow. Well, that one's easy. Um, God has been, I mean, just, I don't think we're going to get into this, but, uh, you know, high school, I was a drug addict and drug dealer and had a profound spiritual experience the day before leaving for college and something I wasn't looking for, wasn't asking for that completely revolutionized my life and earthly experience and everything good that's happened since then. I give him the credit for. So yeah, that that's my answer on that one. Awesome. I love it. And we may get into that. We'll see. Okay. Uh, so if you could narrow it down to one thing that has had the greatest impact on your success, what would it be? So the first thing that comes to mind is taking action quickly, uh, not being afraid to yeah, jump in and pull the trigger. I, 
I feel like there can be so much analyzing and, you know, you just never make money analyzing if you don't pull the trigger after at least taking a look at what you're about to do. That makes a lot of sense. What is your superpower? This is part of question too. So I'm slipping in a, I'm slipping in a fifth kind of. Okay. My superpower, um, I would say one of them is uh, living in flow, living not from striving. Um, I feel like I have everything that I'll ever need already. And everything that's working out on the exterior is from a place of fullness and abundance, as opposed to trying to get to fullness or abundance. So, um, living in the flow of life, the timing of things, you know, there can, I feel like a lot of times in business and success, it's like drive, drive, drive. But if you can keep yourself in a place of peace, there's certain points where there should be a spike of energy because there's a, there's an opportunity. There's a, a moment that came that you have to seize. If we're always striving, we may either miss that moment or we may not have the resources to jump on it in the way that we should. So staying at a place of peace and being able to seize those special moments, I would say it's been super helpful. That's awesome. What was your greatest setback and what'd you learn from it? I'm not sure how to answer that, but one thing I will say is before getting into real estate investing, I had about a 10 year period of what on the outside would have looked like zero financial success, but it was a decade of internal development and preparation, character building and leadership development. Um, through ministry, through traveling all over the world, 20 plus countries, um, laid a foundation for then what would come later, but it certainly wouldn't have looked like, hey, this person is going to be successful business-wise or anything that way. Yeah, it gives me a lot of insight. And this is what I love about these initial questions. It gives me a lot of insight because you know you struggle with your greatest setback. And I understand um, it's not like your life's been perfect, but you don't really look at a lot of this stuff as setbacks necessarily. It was learning opportunities. So totally. uh, I'm excited to dig into that a little further too. Cool. What is the piece of advice you find yourself sharing the most? Probably being deliberate with who you surround yourself with. Um, your friend circle can make such a big difference. For me, I remember is it cool to like go into a little bit of a story here or are yeah, these like yeah. rapid fire things? Yeah, anything you want. Cool. I remember getting involved in real estate. You know, we had like zero properties, then one property, then two properties, going to all the local meetups that are all beginner real estate investor based. And then once we figured out a few things in real estate investing from the inside, we bought like 50 units in less than two years. So in a short amount of time, we went from two units to 50 plus, and the people in those groups started to look at me different. So for me, that was not a huge accomplishment, even though I was super grateful. But for the people in those rooms, it was like, oh my goodness, here comes the guy with 50 units, mm -hmm. which I did not like the feeling of. I don't want to be around people that that's impressive. So I remember praying and just really desiring those next level relationships. And when those came, guys like Dave Zook, guys like um, some local leader, you know, the biggest landlord in our area, um, now a good friend, that just changed everything. When you get around people where what you want is just normal everyday life, it does something to your subconscious where it's like, okay, this is now not only possible somewhere in the future, but there it is normal. And that can be my normal. So I give a lot of credit to those relationships because that made a huge impact in our trajectory. You know, what's so interesting about what you just said too. And I think about this a lot because, you know, you were talking about the people in the room that are like, oh, there's that guy with the 50 doors or mm -hmm. however you said it. 
Um, and I understand what you were saying. Like, you know, you, that wasn't impressive to you. Um, because you, you you know, you want to get into rooms of higher people, but what's so interesting and Karen, I talk about this a lot. You don't know how amazing you are because you live inside your own head every day. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, And so that's what I'm so passionate about here at an investing for freedom. And that's why I want people like you on my show is because even though you're, um, I, I don't want to say that you're not satisfied because I know you're satisfied as an individual, but you're always going to be pushing yourself to a higher level of what you know that you can do in life. And and to really be able to achieve your, your full potential. So you're always going to be pushing yourself to more. Mm-hmm. And from what I know about you too, it, you know, part of that's a, a give, I mean, the, the more you have, the more you can give, right? percent. But I think sometimes what we have to be careful with too, is to just not take the eye off the fact that, um, while we're not satisfied or happy with where we're at, we got to pay attention to how much, um, value and giftings we can bring to the world. Yeah. To those people that are looking at the guy with the 50 doors, right? Yep. It may not seem impressive to you, but to the guy that has no doors or doesn't have any passive income, I mean, you're, you've got so much to offer that person. Right. And so, um, I understand completely what you were saying, but I've just kind of been on this journey lately too. And, and again, that's my passion behind, in, uh, launching investing for freedom. There's so many people out there that know that there's more. Um, they want more cash flow in their life. You know, maybe it's just simply they they need one more vacation per year. And how do we get that? Yeah. Um, and when we talk about, I'm not saying let's not get into this today at all. We absolutely need to. But when we talk about 50 doors, that's so unreachable to some people because sure. so let's dig, let's go backwards a little bit. Um, I want to go all the way back to the high school thing. So let's get into the drug experience in high school because wow. we've got okay. a similar, um, we got a similar background there. Okay. Are we okay with that? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, no, nothing's off limits. Um, so I can remember as a young person, uh, like let's say eight, nine years old, having experiences with God where I would feel his love around me and I'd just be very aware of him. But I don't know why I went so rebellious, but about 12 years old is when I found my brother's stash. I think he'd given me like a, uh, some chewing tobacco and I saw where he got that from. And I, so I was going to put it back quote unquote to check what else he had in there. So I found some drugs and jumped into that whole steam. I'm not really a, you know, lukewarm type person. It's either on or off. <laughs> so 12 to 19 was pretty dark. I mean, there was, there was a couple year period where I don't think I was sober once I would wake up first thing in the morning, smoke, smoke pot, go to high school, lunch, do the same thing after school, evening, late at night. Now I wouldn't be sober by the time I woke up the next morning. My, my tag phrase was sober sucks. So that was my, um, experience. People used to call me by my last name, Manthe. That's how they called me. I used to not even like to hear my last name called because it was so synonymous with a drug persona Mm. that, I didn't even want to hear it called. So summer after high school, I started running uh, drugs up from uh, Minneapolis, a small town up in northern Minnesota where I lived. And I was having a going away party. And I was leaving my house to go to this party and I was leaving the next day. And I had tried to get sober a couple times. It would last like 24 hours. But during one of these 24 hour sober periods, I told my mom, Hey, I'm going to stay clean now. You know, this is how you check and see if I'm back in it, you know, gave her some things to look for. And then 24 hours later, I was back in it. So I'm leaving my house. My mom says, Hey, are you staying clean? And she'd never asked me that in my life. And I could look her straight in the eyes and say, yes, mom, I'm staying clean. She asked me like seven times. And I don't know why. Well, I I do know why. I think she was being prompted. So I looked her seven times in the eyes and said, yes, mom, I'm staying clean. And we'd done all kinds of stuff that day. So we go to this party. I'm typically the life of the party. I'm empty and depressed when I'm alone. But when I'm around people, you know, at that time I was happy and, and looked happy. But everything just changed around me. Um, I became... So it wasn't like I got taken physically out of my body, but in my perspective, I was taken to a third person perspective 
So I get to this party, everything's so different around me. I can't talk to anybody. I can't do anything. I go sit in a chair, close my eyes. And in my perspective, it's like I'm taken to a third person perspective, shown my life. And it looks like this dark, deep, downward spiral. And I can see that there's nothing of positive value in any of it. It's hurting me. It's hurting my family. Nothing good is coming from it. And I just watched this for about, I don't know, I'm going to guess five minutes. I don't recall, but, and I finally said, this is my party. It's so awkward for everyone else. They're literally like reading a cookbook. Like they don't know what to do. I finally said, guys, I got to go take care of something. I went home. As soon as I stepped over the threshold of our house, I broke apart like a baby. I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I prayed, asked God to forgive me. And I didn't know I was carrying any weight, but it literally felt like a thousand pounds got lifted off of me. I went from being depressed to being truly joyful from the inside. Um, years of drug uh, addiction that I tried to quit multiple times broke off me. I mean, if I could bottle this stuff and give it to treatment places, I mean, no cold turkey, like never had a desire, never had a um, craving. It just all snapped off me uh, in one night. And so from there, I kind of, yeah, I wanted to get to know this God that reached out to me when I was, my deliberate thought during that time was, God, I don't want anything to do with you. Stay away from me. I want to do what I want to do and have fun. But to me, that should have gotten a lightning bolt or a trip in front of a bus instead of an intervention like that. So I'm unbelievably grateful. Did you see, uh, I, I had a similar experience. Um, wow. Yeah. Which we won't get into today. Um, cause this is about you. Well, I'd love to hear it sometime. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in, um, think and grow rich, um, he says when one desires a thing, the thing presents itself. Um, yeah. there's another phrase, you know, when the student is ready, the master will appear. Do you believe, and there's no right or wrong in this. I'm just, just wondering, do you, obviously there's no right or wrong. Um, do you, did you see, did you have glimpses of what was going to replace that? Or did you, did, were you longing for something more? Or did you just have this, like you crossed that threshold and melted, um, were you beginning to see glimpses of another life or was it, or did it just happen? Did God just meet you? It really just happened. I, from experiences that I had younger, um, some interventions in our family where, uh, we had, like my brother got a fish hook in his eye and this guy prayed for him and the fish hook, they watched it come out of his eye. Um, he still has a scar. So I knew God was real. And again, there's no halfway with me. So I was either fully on or fully off. So when I came, I came with everything. Um, but I, there was nothing conscious saying like, Hey, I really want to change or anything. It was this intervention. But once I crossed over, it was, it was all guns blazing. Okay. So you said that there was like a 10 year period, like with no real financial success, but you were learning leadership, all that. So let's dive into that. Was that this period of time? Yeah. After so, this? Yeah. So from that, I just, I started spending a couple hours a day, just wanting to get to know this God again, it's either going to be real or I'll go do something else. Cause I don't need to show up in a certain building on a certain day for a certain couple hours and tell myself, you know, happy clappy. This is mm -hmm. what spirituality is. Uh, thankfully. He came to me at a party, so you can't tell me you need to go to a building to have an experience with God. So just diving into, hey, I want something real and of substance with this being that loved me enough to uh, intervene in my life. And that actually led me to starting a business. Um, so <laughs> I felt in prayer one day that he asked me to start a construction company, and I had I'd been a laborer for nine months. I, um, you know, sometimes ignorance can be a good thing because you don't know how ridiculous what you're about to do is. So I started a company in 
had that for a few years and right about at the point where I'm, you know, going to start making some money, felt like said, Hey, let's go do something else. Um, so every day in my company, I felt like a second class citizen because anytime I would go to church, they never brought the business leaders up, the investors up and said, Hey, these people are taking a major risk, major step of faith in this new business venture, this new investment. Never saw that, but it was like, hey, these people are going to Africa or whatever. So I felt like unless I was in ministry, I was a second-class citizen mm. from God's perspective. So when we, when I closed the company and went into the ministry, traveled 20-some countries all over the world, um, saw the most unbelievable things, it was like, oh, this is the most amazing. You know, this is my dream come true. And it was years through that process. And I'm so grateful for it because, like I said, that built the foundation of what happened next. But it was years through that process that I realized thinking that ministry is more noble than business or investing or anything else is a complete lie. And all any of us can do is be faithful to who we've been created to be. And if that's in business, do you think you're going to go into ministry and when you've been called to business? And God's going to look like, oh, good job. That's what I wanted you to do or whatever. Um, faithfulness to who we've been created is the most noble thing. So it took a while to kind of get that worked out of me. But once it did, and he started talking to me about going back into business, back into investing, back into the financial world, um, I could actually do it with my whole heart mm. instead of a quarter of my heart and three quarters feeling like, oh, this is dirty. Yeah. Because it's not. No, it's totally not. It's interesting. Karen and I were just having a conversation this last week about, you know, um, the Bible talks about, um, you know, he gave some to be prophets, um, pastors, evan uh, uh, some to be evangelists, prophets, pastors, teachers, yep. and apostles, right? Apostles, right? So we were talking about that. And it's interesting, even in the business world, like we're in this mastermind and I'm just sitting here looking at some of the coaches and what they're doing and even though they're outside of, so those are giftings, right? And I realize yeah. that those are specific to like the church and how, you know, things, I don't mean church, like the building I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent on the, I'm not opposed to a building, yeah. but also like there's giftings. Right. And yeah. it's funny because even in the business realm, like when people are okay with their giftings, we all have different giftings. Right. And you can see a parallel there. Like I can totally see this guy that I'm in a mastermind with. And this guy's basically like an apostle of this entire movement that totally. just has to do with business. Right. So. Yeah. It's kind of interesting when you open your mind to the fact that God gave some to be priests and some to be kings and, yeah. um, you know, just even having, it's interesting that we're having a conversation with a successful business guy and we're okay having this spiritual conversation too, totally. because I think a lot of people don't want to mix those two conversations. And I mean, that's part of life. It is. Um, Finances are part of life. It's not, I, I know just by knowing you that money is not a focus in your life, mm -hmm. but you can't go accomplish what, whatever you were destined to be without financial resources. Well. 100%. And it's not necessarily the focus, but that's so interesting that you talk about how, you know, you're grateful for that period of time because, you know, you got to do amazing things, but then when you were ready to go back into business, so you were okay going full in and knowing that God was behind you a hundred percent too. Okay. So you're, you you don't have to be a pastor to be loved by God. Is that <laughs> uh, not if you haven't been called to that? I yeah. That. Yeah. There's no separation. Um, yeah. He's everywhere all the time and he created business just like he created, you know, uh, the priesthood or whatever. He created everything. And if we want to be imitators of him, we have to know, which aspects he's called us to imitate and then let his power come through who he's created us to be, to express that on the earth. And that can be finance. That can be business. That can be teaching. That can be healthcare. That can be ministry. It's all alignment with who you've been created to be. Yeah. I'm not making excuses for you or I, or anybody else that's out there. Um, you know, you said you don't do anything halfway. You didn't say it that way, but um, you're, you're an all or nothing kind of guy. So I'm not making excuses for people that, you know, are trapped and haven't gotten rid of their drug addictions or alcohol or anything else. But that being said, um, 
do you feel that um sometimes like i know i've in my life i've gone down the roads that i've gone down because i have so much like focus and drive and i just get connected with the wrong things so how I, again you had you had a straightforward experience with god i understand that um but then you just did a complete 180 you were ready that's kind of why i brought up when when the student is ready the teacher will appear whether it's god or just a mentor in life and i think mm-hmm. we're both um you know we spend time with a lot of mentors and believe that wherever we want to go so you went all in you surrendered um you went through this period of time with business and then ministry so take me you you left the ministry or you maybe didn't leave the ministry that might be a bad way to say it um you changed you switched directions did you get you got called back to business what well, yeah i felt like he started talking to me about um, going into the financial uh, arena of life. And I thought that meant banking. I'm grateful it's been a different path. But one of the things that changed for me was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That book blew my mind and opened me up to concepts that I had no, no perception of before. Um, growing up, money wasn't a real positive topic. so. So to hear it put in the in the ways that Robert Kiyosaki did uh, was life changing. So I started reading all kinds of books when I was still in ministry on real estate and investing, and then when I left ministry, I was in New Zealand at the time. moved uh, moved back to the states, had a couple months with my family, and then moved out to Pennsylvania to get to know this beautiful young lady. Uh, and and who is she? Kristen, <laughs> my lovely wife. Cool. Um, so we got married. We were renting an old farmhouse. And, you know, I wanted to get involved with investing. I had zero money. I mean, you know, being on the mis- mission field, you know, there was no capital. My wife, on the other hand, had lived at home for 10 years, worked hard, gone without a lot that she could have had and had saved up $25,000. So we got married. I go out to breakfast with this guy who has 10 rental properties, a friend of her family and awesome guy. I'm talking to him, telling him I want to get involved. And he's like, well, Hey, I have a foreclosure that the bank has been dragging their feet. Um, It's been months and months and months. Now they're ready to settle but I've got two other projects I'm in the middle of. I'd love for my real estate agent to still get the commission. How about you step in and buy this property? Like, okay, how much is it? It was $25,000. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. So I go back home and I think you're probably the same way, but I am hyper focused on learning lessons from other people that I don't have to make the same mistake and learn for myself. One of those things was I'd heard half a dozen times throughout the years, men that I respected say, I wish I would have learned years earlier to trust my wife's intuition. Hmm. It would have saved me all kinds of headache. So I had already committed I don't need to learn that lesson myself. My wife and I will either be in unity on stuff or we won't do it. So when I presented it, I didn't have any emotion on we needed to do it, but I could see the opportunity. For my wife, it was, okay, you want to take all our life savings and buy a rental property when we're still living in an old farmhouse renting every month. So, well, you put it that way. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good opportunity and this is actually going to catapult us forward instead of just leaving that money there. So she said, well, you know, this is kind of outside everything I've ever been taught. You know, her parents on the other hand from mine have been very successful and had taught her, you know, don't spend all your money, uh, have stuff for a rainy day, um, have some cash reserves. So for her, uh, am I going to listen to my new husband who has no experience or my parents? So she just, she couldn't bring those two worlds together. So she finally said, Hey, let's go talk to my parents. I'm like, Hey, no problem. I don't have an ego in this until I realized on the way over, we're going to talk to her parents about using her life savings 
to do something that I think is a good idea. I have no money. I have no experience. So I realize the predicament I'm in and I decide I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. So we get there and she lays it all out. I think I might've given some basic details of the deal, but otherwise I don't say anything. And her parents basically say, sweetheart, when we do our big developments, every single time we lay it all on the line, we put our house up, we do, we do what we need to do to, to make a way for the reward of the future. You don't get anywhere without risk. This seems like a good opportunity and we think you guys should do it. So I give my wife a lot of credit because as soon as she knew like, hey, this wasn't outside the realm of good wisdom, you know, there's different counsel for different seasons of life. When you're a single lady, yeah, you don't want to spend everything on, you know, the next opportunity. But when you're building a life together, building a, a family and a foundation for a successful future, there comes a point where you have to pull the trigger. So she reevaluated and we did that first deal and it's been amazing. It's been awesome. You know, I have to give you credit too. Um, and I don't know whether you've processed this or not, but that that's really cool that you, you know, you didn't have an ego in that and to let that kind of play out. Uh, you know, one of my mentors taught me a long time ago to never fall in love with the property, fall in love with the deal. Yeah. And I'm just reading into this because, I mean, obviously, who knows what the emotions were and what was that. But you had very little to say in that. Um, and you just you just kind of let the deal flow. And I appreciate that about you in that situation, too, because there's sometimes like when we're trying to make things happen, this right. is where I think, you know, people have to really get into that intuition, whether it's the wife's intuition or or you hearing God or the universe or whatever it is that our listeners believe about yeah. even just their, you know, inner Jiminy Cricket, whatever yep. you want to call it. Um, <laughs> To get in tune with that, um, and we'll dig on this a little bit more, but when you were talking about flow earlier and just getting into that that state, yeah, um, just living life there. I, I really appreciate just reading between the lines in that because even at an early age, um, obviously you were probably very excited about getting this deal done. And, you know, yeah, it's scary, right? You're about to put your whole life savings on the line, but you're a risk taker too. And I could see mm -hmm. just talking through this. That's what I so appreciate about my wife and I's relationship because- um, there's balance there, right? Right. Um, so I love the way you approach that. Um, and even though like you, you realized on the way there, like this could maybe not go my way, right? right? And, but you just let it flow. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. So cool. I think there's yeah, a yeah. nugget in there um, with people, you know, we just can't be so married to whether it's a business deal or a relationship yeah. or, you know, what we see as a certain outcome. I mean, sometimes you just got to step back and just let it be. And, yeah. and I, I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. A fruit tree doesn't expend effort to produce fruit. Mm -hmm. It stays healthy and the fruit is natural. So if this deal wouldn't have come together, there would have been another one. But keeping peace and health in the situation and relationships and whether my ego got bruised or what, whatnot in the thing didn't really matter. Um, but keeping a healthy situation will produce the fruit mm -hmm. instead of feeling like, Oh, I need that result. I need another building. I need another unit. Yeah. And that's such an abundance mindset. And I would just like to make sure that we, you know, dig in on this a little bit because I mean, just even sitting in this room, like I, I feel the abundance with you. And I think, I think that's one thing that hinders all of us if we're not flowing in that and realizing that what I'm hearing you say is that if that deal didn't work out, there's another one, right? Totally. There's, there's plenty of money. There's plenty of opportunities. There's, there's plenty of relationships. It, it has to be right and you have to let that stuff flow. And so for our listeners that, you know, get maybe wound up, I just want to make sure that we don't just wax over that because, um, I used to have a guy that, and this is a funny way to say it, but he always said, I don't have a dog in this hunt. Yeah. Um, and you know, basically what he was saying is the outcome, I'm going to separate myself from the outcome yeah. because it doesn't mean we can just stand by and hope that things come together for us and, you know, not do anything right. We were having this conversation earlier, like you right. can't just sit by and wait for things to happen to you, which is what most people are doing. You've yeah. got to go out and make things happen. But at the same time, you've got to find that balance of flow yeah. and know when to sit back and just say, okay, you know what? I can't control certain things and, and just see how you, you couldn't, you couldn't control what her parents were going to say. And totally. I so appreciate the way you handled that because, and, and, and knowing them, I mean, they're very wise people. They're awesome. Yeah. yeah. But you didn't go in trying to control that. And you know, there's another 
version of me that might want to be like, okay, so here's the deal and here's how it's structured and here's how amazing kind of try to guide that. Right. But what I appreciated about what you said there too, was you might've said a few things, but you really didn't guide that. Right. Cause it was, it was her safe zone. Um, you let that be, and that's a sign of a number one, a mature husband, but also a mature investor. So I, I, I applaud you. I oh, appreciate it, man. Thank you. And that was a long time ago. So it was. Yeah, six years. Cool. So tell me, um, you know, here at Investing for Freedom, we're always talking about, you know, what, what do you want? Why do you want it? Um, what are you going to do to get it? So first off, tell me just, I, I hear the background. I hear kind of the journey and it's amazing, by the way. But when, when you started really looking at this, I, I know this investment opportunity found you. But was it there any kind of thought processes behind why you wanted to start investing in real estate? What was the was there like some epiphany moments early on where you guys said we need to build our passive income? We talk a lot about the freedom number, right? So mm -hmm. kind of was there a clear defined moment or Yeah, I mean from rich dad poor dad, that concept of when your investment income exceeds your monthly expenses, mm -hmm. you are free. That thing got lodged deep in me deeper than I even realized. Um, so that became, I'd almost say a carrot on a stick that was a motivator for, uh, what we built. So I had already looked at real estate. I mean, there's just so many, imp you know, positive aspects of investing in real estate from the tax benefits to the cash flow, the debt, um, depreciation, uh, having something tangible, um, so there's incredible benefits and it just fit with that freedom that was so important to us. Um, when we talk about getting out of the rat race or the freedom number, as I call it, um, did you, ha did you think about a specific number? Did you guys have a number or was it more of like just a philosophy? I'd say it was a, it was a philosophy. You know, we saw rich dad's or uh, Robert Kiyosaki's goal in his book of buying two properties a year. And at the end of 10 years, you'd have 20. So that seemed like a decent goal. Um, we bought our first deal. Then we bought a piece of land to build a house the first year, second year we built a house and bought another single. And then we got some really great news. My wife was pregnant. Ah. And in processing that, she said, Hey, I'd love to, I'd love to stay home. I've always wanted to be a stay at home mom. I thought, Hey, awesome. That sounds great. You know, she was obviously working at the time. So we started looking for a larger property that could replace her, her income. So we found one. It was, uh, it was like two apartments, six garages two small warehouses and like four storage units. You know, it was a, it was a bigger deal than we'd done, but it was still pretty modest. And the cash flow from that just barely exceeded her part-time income. So we were high five and so excited until we got a call one Saturday night from our realtor who said, Hey, just to let you know, we just lost that contract. And there was, without going too far into the weeds, the mortgage contingency letter from our bank hadn't seen the appraisal yet. So mm -hmm. they just said, hey, these are good clients, but we haven't seen the appraisal. Um, this, was, this property was through an estate. So the lawyer for the estate told his agent, hey, don't tell the buyers this, but I'm not going to accept this letter as satisfying this condition. We're going to let this mortgage contingency date come and go cancel their contract because we have a buyer for 5,000 more that we'll sell it to. Hmm. So if they would have told us, we would have done something different. They didn't. So we lost this contract and, you know, I'll never forget it. I mean, it felt like the provision for my wife to stay at home was being taken from us. So I was upset. I was pissed. You had an ego in it now. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it, it, this was like, no, I get it. Yeah. yeah. This is for my wife to stay home. Yeah. This is not cool. So, uh, ego got fired up. <laughs> so that Saturday night I woke up Sunday morning and this was just outside of my ability to do. I was completely at peace and I'd been paying attention to 
those feelings for long enough to know what that meant. So I told my wife, I said, sweetheart, I know what this looks like, but watch, this is going to work to our advantage. God's got something better for us. I said the same thing to our real estate agent. So the next week we're out looking at other properties on the market. The only ones we could find on the market were like two units, three units. So I'm thinking, hey, we'll find a way to buy a few of those. And we're about to go into one and she checks her phone and she says, oh, that's interesting. And I said, what? She said, well, that same estate just put another property on the market. And my first response was, you know, we do a deal together and you're, you know, you lack integrity. That's on you. But if I come around for a second try with the same group that doesn't have integrity, that's on me. Mm. You know, I have no interest in, in dealing with these people again. As soon as I said that to her, I just felt something go in my heart. And I was like, wait a minute. This may be the thing that we knew was coming for, for God to bless us through this. So I said, you know, let's look at it. So it was a 10-unit building, um, seven apartments, a warehouse, a small office, and a grocery store. And um, so long story short, the family for the estate did not know or approve of what their lawyer did mm. and felt bad because they were people of integrity. The, the family had had like 30 properties. It all came down to this. This was the last one, the best cash flow property there was. Coming up on the end of the year, they wanted to close the estate, be done with it. So we made them a really low cash offer. I said, there's no contingencies. You know, we're not giving any back doors on this thing. Um, so we bought this thing, got a hard money loan for it. We didn't have the cash to buy it, but we figured out a way to just make a cash offer. Right away, took it to our bank to refinance. It appraised for, I don't know, 150, 160 more than we bought it for. So the bank gave us all the money back for the hard money loan, 10 grand for our pocket, and a $75,000 line of credit. And this property cash flowed way more than the other one. Um, it's been such a blessing to us over the years. So that whole experience, number one, again, just another experience with the faithfulness of God. Mm -hmm. um, the $75,000 let us go out and keep buying. But the more valuable lesson in that whole thing was knowing that I didn't have to bring my money to the table. I could figure out a way to creatively finance it, get the property purchased. If I purchase it under market, under value, get it reappraised, get all the money back, and then take that same chunk of equity and do it again and again and again. So that's what allowed us to take the concept in that credit line and buy another 40 plus units over the next two years. That's amazing. Um, we hear, we hear these stories, you know, I mean, I've, I have my stories, you have your stories, but for the listeners that are like, okay, that's great, Michael. Um, you can do that, but I don't have any experience in real estate. I don't have any experience in finance. I don't know how to talk to an attorney about trust planning. What, what do you say to that person? Well, I would agree with them on the last one. Um, <laughs> did, so, did you have, I mean, did. So I always knew that real estate investing would be different from the inside than it looks from the outside. Mm -hmm. So you look at anything from the outside and it looks, you know, impossible. I mean, when you don't know how to do something, it looks impossible. So we'd bought a couple properties. We had two single family houses. We didn't go for a 10 unit our first mm -hmm. time out of the gate. Um, but, you know, getting in the game is the most important thing that anyone can do. All this podcast and events and books, I believe all of it is to give enough self-confidence to pull the trigger. Mm. And then the real learning starts. So, you know, we'd, I'd say, you know, get started with something. You have to build your experience, build your education base on something. Uh, don't say, hey, if I can't buy a 100-unit building by myself or I can't buy a 10-unit with none of my own cash, I'm not going to do anything. You know, you're going to stay in that position. But get started with something, and you have to educate into those, into those areas. I love it. We're going to circle back to the educate because you guys have a group that you do, but I'm going to circle back to that. Sure. Um, 
So what's your big why? You already kind of said early on what it was. It was the passive income. Your wife wanted to be a stay at home mom, right? Yep. Wanted to replace her income, which yep. is similar to mine and Kara's story. But let's go a little deeper on the why, because, uh, you know, a lot of times it, um, we talk about the what. For me, it's manufactured homes and business for you. Um, I'll let you get into that. But what's the why? Like, why are you doing what, what you wake up every day and what's like, what's your heartbeat? It's different now than it was then. Um, it's changed for me. So, you know, for a while it was that, that freedom number. And we talked about this earlier, but getting to that point looked, you know, we were so grateful to, to do it in just a couple of years. But it was honestly for for the the drive that we had at the time, it was empty. You know, I had built this concept of retirement, of kicking back, of more time with the family, of more travel. And those are all beautiful things. And when you're in the grind, um, it sounds great to relax until you figure out that chasing comfort and chasing relaxation is such an empty experience mm. so we got to that point i left my job and you know really relaxed uh for about a week and i needed to <laughs> because you know i've been working 60 hours a week and buying and self-managing these units so i needed to rest but after about a week all my energy came back and i said man the last thing that i feel okay with is coasting through life on my easy chair. Like that is not why I've been put on this planet. But our, my expectation at that point was completely blank. Like I had no future to look forward to. It was, you know, just off a cliff and, and then uh, retirement. So it was a ex existential experience to reevaluate everything and spend a bunch of time in prayer, a lot of time talking with, with Kristen to figure out like, okay, we could do anything. What do we want to do? Mm. And we realized, Hey, as much fun as this has been buying and, and making a bunch of money in real estate and investment income and, and all of that, it would be a whole lot more meaningful, fulfilling, uh, to do it with other people. Mm. So we changed everything of how we did stuff. Uh, since that time, we haven't bought anything just ourselves. We learned syndication so that we could do it in a group with other people. Explain, explain what syndication is. Cause you and I know, but sure. I think that's a foreign term sometimes. It can be. Yep. So syndication is basically it's, you could look at it like team investing. Mm -hmm. So somebody identifies a property and creates legal structure for those that may not have either the time, the experience or the desire to actively participate in real estate investing, you make an opportunity for them to invest alongside of you. So the same properties that we were buying for ourselves, we started buying with investor partners. So we would create a structure where, you know, if Johnny and Susie wanted to put a hundred grand somewhere, maybe they didn't trust the stock market. Maybe they, you know, didn't, yeah, maybe they wanted to put it in something, you know, backed in real estate. Do, uh, do they get, they get the tax benefits and everything like, I mean, so the, for the person that doesn't want to go out and do real estate on their own, they're, they're a doctor and they're making good money or even they work at a mechanic shop. Yep. Um, they can invest generally speaking, I'm not saying specifically with you guys, but they can, they can invest and get the benefits of cash flow and owning that real estate and the tax benefits, depreciation, all of that. Totally. Awesome. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. And you know, you get access to a better quality team typically. Mm -hmm. So you get economies of scale, access to a better quality team. Um, it's really, I feel like it's an amazing way for people to get involved without having a lot of experience, uh, and learn through that process. So, you know, we, I'm, I wanted to do everything from the ground up, self-managed, you know, buying our own buildings, um, learning each aspect. But I don't think I'd suggest that for everybody. Sure. Well, Michael, what, I mean, just an amazing, inspiring story. I, 
uh, you know, we dug in a little personal stuff there, which I think is awesome. It's cool to see what you've came through and out of and persevered. And I have firsthand knowledge of, um, your, your family and, um, the life you've built. So it's pretty amazing to see the, the life of freedom that you've built. And I appreciate what you said too, about, um, you know, retiring for a week, what you needed. Um, but here's, here's what I was really excited to hear. You guys said to each other, you know, we could basically do whatever we want. Yeah. What is it that we actually want to do? And I would just challenge our listeners. It doesn't matter what stage they're at. They totally. should be asking that question because sometimes, and this is when I say, what do you want? Which is question number one. I say, what do you really want? If you look at that five part question that I'm always asking, mm. that's why I throw the really in there because a lot of times what we think we want, there was a period of time where, um, you know, we'd go on vacation and, and Karen, and I would be like, we want to live here. And what I realized is that's not actually really what we wanted. We wanted the experience. We loved the experience of being out of our normal environment on that vacation. But if we actually lived in that town, yeah. it wouldn't be the same experience. It was that yeah. vacation. It was that getaway. It was recreation, right? We, were, we had that time where we were down. And so what we really wanted was more opportunities to be away together and to recreate ourselves. Recreation, right? Totally. Um, so I loved what you said there. I mean, you guys found yourself in a position where you could do whatever you want and you started asking the right question, but it doesn't matter where our listeners are at. They should be asking that question today. Yep. It's not necessarily always a million dollar financial conversation, right? Sometimes it's just an additional vacation every year. How do we get an extra 4,000 or $6,000 to take our family on one more vacation? Yep. And I remember, you know, my kids are older now, but even growing up, some of their favorite vacations didn't really cost us that much. So a lot of times what we think we want is not what we really actually want. And I just wanted to dig in on that a little bit because I appreciated what you said there. When you hit that retirement, it lasted about a week. Right. And then you guys really started digging on what you want. So I love everything that you're doing with community. So let's, let's kind of wrap this up. Um, what I've appreciated watching from the outside, um, you're doing a lot of what you're doing because of that community. You mm -hmm. can go further faster with people. Yep. Um, talk to us about your group. You've got a group called Elevate. Yep. Elevate Investing Group. It's been an amazing experience to build a community. Our speakers that come in, they just, I'm so proud of the quality of the people that we have, the character of the people that we have. Um, it's just awesome to see a community growing that values more than just financial success. So often in, you know, some of these business success circles, it's, it's, pursuing like you said an empty an empty goal mm -hmm. um so to value family to value character to value long-term relationships to value um being healthy in all aspects of life is really what our group is about so we we talk about um wealth strategies for inspired living uh, we want to be the full expression of who we've been created to be and, you know, our flavor is, you know, there's a wealth aspect to this that, you know, it's really hard to, it's almost cruel to have a big heart and no capacity to help. That's interesting. Um, so, and one of the things that I've had to overcome and a lot of our members have, like this concept of if, as long as I just have enough to meet my bill, mm. I don't want to be too greedy. How selfish is it to only want enough to cover your bills? Yeah. Like there's this false humility that is on that, but it's actually completely selfish. Why don't we blow the top off this thing and be able to change the world? So we're honored and excited to be in a community where we inspire each other to have a better future than any of us have had in the past and a better future because of each other than any of us could have without the other one. Wow. That's amazing. So you guys have an event coming up in August. Um, how do people find out more about that event? So August 28 and 29 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, last year, uh, we had 250 plus people fly in from all over. Um, amazing speakers, uh, Robert Helms and uh, Dave Zook, uh, Kyle Wilson, Dana Samuelson. Um, a lot of amazing speakers. Yeah, so if people if people want to go uh, learn about the event and sign up, um, best place is www.investelevate.com. 
That's awesome. And where can people find out about you personally? Facebook, Instagram, what's your, what's your. Facebook is probably the most active for me. Um, so my first name, last name. Michael Manthe. Yep. Cool. I'll put that in the show notes. Cool. Hey, I really appreciate your transparency and going deep with us because, you know, just having a conversation about real estate investing in money is, is it, it's fun and it's interesting, but understanding, you know, where you came from and the fact that you weren't born, um, you know, with a mom or dad that was a real estate guru and Mm -hmm. got you to where you're at is, is where the power is. So um, I appreciate you being transparent and honest and being with us today. Hey, appreciate you. Love everything that you guys stand for and are doing and honored to be a part of it today. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. If you found value in this episode and you know someone who's wanting to start or move further along in their journey toward investing for freedom, I would be forever grateful if you would share this show with them and help me get this message out to more listeners. Also, if you enjoy what you've heard, I would appreciate it if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. And until the next episode, cheers to moving further along in your journey of investing for freedom.